All right, brethren. Well, we are. Uh, it's it's somewhat of an odd time to start this because you would. It's just there's only two weeks left in the year, and so it just didn't seem like the perfect place to do it. But what we're gonna do now is we're gonna enter into a series of dealing with the parables of Jesus. So we're going to be going through the Gospels, and we're going to see uh, all these parables that Jesus speaks to the people. And I'll tell you one thing that I've recognized, even just briefly, uh, not just dealing with this one, but sort of taking a brief overview of what we're seeing in the Gospels as Jesus is preaching. And he, there's a lot of parables. I mean, a lot. So we're not going to be able to deal with all of them. We're going to pick some of the probably most prominent ones and also lump a number of them together. And we'll we'll kind of flesh that out a little more as the weeks go. But we're going to begin to deal with the parables of Jesus. And we want to do two things here. I was talking with, uh, I think I was talking with Nick about it last night. But uh, we have been pretty much from the start of the church and even before that very sort of topical and two reasons for that one is uh aaron and i tend to lean that route and manny gets often outvoted in preaching through a particular book but 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 the other reason is in a church like this um, some of you have never been here before, but in a church like this, there's a lot of new believers. And it has been very fruitful, I think, for them, for us to deal with things topically in the Bible so that they can see what is the Bible teaching. Um, we may find ourselves in uh, the next 10 years uh, dealing with an entire book and, and dealing with it at length. But there has been some real fruitfulness, I think, in in preaching the way that we have. But nevertheless, as we come to the parables, I think what you will get is both sides of that. You will get, in some sense, topical preaching because we're going to be dealing with different parables each week. But we're going to be going into the text and we're going to be pulling out of that text what it's saying. So we're going to be sort of doing verse by verse preaching as we're also going all over different places of the Bible. So I think it will, will, I hope anyway, that it will pretty much uh, sort of fit into the groove of whatever it is that you prefer in regards to preaching. But we're going to start here. Matthew chapter 13 is going to be where we're going to sort of step off into these parables. And then we'll deal with others as the weeks come. But I want to lay a little bit of a groundwork for us. So What I want to do is give you a couple of definitions so that as we move forward through these weeks, you have you have your bearings a little bit. You're able to come to the parables yourself and maybe not deal with them totally, but you're not going to be lost. So uh, I was listening to this earlier this week and Nikki and my wife heard me playing it and they were looking at me like I was crazy. But there's an old children's musical and it's called The Storytelling Man. And the, it's a musical basically about the parables of Jesus. So you have a couple of songs in, introductory that just talk about this. And then each of these songs go through the parables. And one of these opening songs, it says this. He became a traveling preacher. He became a well-known teacher. People came to hear him speak from all across the land Men who thought themselves important came to hear with many questions, and he told them stories that a child could understand. He was a storytelling man. He was a storytelling man. He came to bring good news to every man. He was a storytelling man. Now, listen, I recognize that that may be, to some degree, an insufficient way to sum up who Christ was. Uh, but a couple of things. First of all, it's a children's song. So don't hold these people to every bit of needing to flesh out every bit of doctrine. But the other thing is this, although a man who told stories is not all that Jesus was, he certainly was not less than that. And I think as we come to trying to, to just define right out of the gate, what is a parable? That's a good start for us. A parable is a story. 
And Jesus spoke often in, in allegories and stories using metaphors, all of this stuff to bring the truth to his hearers. And, and parable is that you have two different words. You have one word, which means to place or to throw. And you have another word, which means alongside. So what a parable is, it is something placed or thrown alongside the truth that Jesus is trying to get across to his hearers. So the idea is that a parable is a story that comes in and is meant to help and to teach the people a spiritual truth. The stories are not, are not the thing in and of themselves, but the stories are to put a picture in our mind. They're to give us an image in our mind, and that image is to illuminate the spiritual truth that is being proclaimed. And a couple of things are important with this. The first one is the parables in Scripture are not intended for you to go with them with a scalpel, so to speak, and scrupulously interrogate every single piece and determine what every single aspect means in its deeper spiritual meaning. We need to come to the parables with a, a general idea that parables are intended to make one particular point. The stories are intended to teach straightforward, unambiguous, uncomplicated lessons, if we would have ears to hear. And so the story, um, when it becomes convoluted and just so confusing because we're trying to nitpick every single piece and give it a, a very deep spiritual meaning, rather than looking at the meaning of the entire parable, we have veered off from what Jesus is intending to do with the parables. And the other thing is this. We need to be careful that we do not mix meanings of things in the parables. There are times when Jesus will speak multiple parables in regards to one particular topic or one particular point. But we need to be very careful, especially when parables come in succession, that we do not take the meaning of one particular element in a parable and automatically imply that same meaning to a similar or the same element in a different parable. One good example of this would be the parable of the four soils, which we're going to look at today. And what you'll notice is the seed being discussed in this parable is actually said to be the Word of God. That's what it references. But then you go a little bit later in Matthew and you get another parable about a wheat field where you find weeds growing up and eventually the weeds are pulled out and, and cast into the fire. And in that parable, you know what the seed is in reference to? It's in reference to the sons of the kingdom which are sown into the world. So you have seed in both, but they actually are not intended to mean the same thing. And now obviously in that example, it's it's clear and it's even stated. Christ tells us the meaning of both of them. So it's not as convoluted. But nevertheless, we do have to be careful. When we are going to examine the parables, we need to allow the context of the particular parable in question to determine what the elements mean and not bring in and just sort of stamp on them all these other meanings from other parables. These are important interpretive frameworks that we need to keep in mind. So having understood a, a parable is a story, it, it's meant to reveal truth, to come alongside this and help us to see it. We need to ask the question, why did Jesus speak in parables? Why did he use them? Why did he preach often in stories and allegories? And um, people will often say that Jesus just simply spoken parables just for the purpose that his teaching would be easy, it would be accessible, it would be um, made very understandable as much as possible. And there's a sense in which this is true, but this is only true for a certain category of people. And I want, I want to show you what I mean. We don't have to wonder why it is that Jesus spoke in parables. He literally tells us if we would simply go to the scriptures and see. So let's look at this. Matthew 13, we're going to read here verses 10 through 17. 
This is Jesus explaining to his disciples not just the purpose of this particular parable, but why he speaks in them all together. Let's read this. When the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. And their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it, and hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So here's the idea. The parables have a twofold purpose. They are meant to reveal, and they are meant to conceal. And I know that may seem somewhat contradictory, but we need to understand that one purpose is meant for one group of people, and another purpose is meant for a different group of people. He says to his disciples, verse 11, to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. So the parables for them have an illuminating function. They actually accomplish the goal of coming alongside the deep spiritual truth. And they do, in fact, make that more clear and more understandable for them. But on the flip side is the effect that it has on the them. In the same verse, you see, it says to you, it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it has not been given. So you see that in, in Mark's account of the same story, he tells us that, that these truths have been given to the disciples, but for those outside is how Mark phrases it. For those outside, everything is in parables. And he basically goes on and says essentially the same things that Matthew says. So there's a reality to those that are inside and those that are outside. And those inside receive the truths and those outside do not receive the truths. And Jesus says that the effect of the parables to those outside is that while they see, they don't see. And while they hear, they don't understand. So the purpose of the parables to those who reject, <coughs> to those who reject Jesus Christ and his message is that they actually become blinded. They, their hearts become hard to the truth because they are unwilling to understand. They refuse to see and hear. And so when Jesus speaks, even in simplistic stories like we'll see in the Gospels, they can't understand them. They become confusing. They're not, they're not clear. They're not able to see. They're not able to see the meaning because they don't want to see the meaning. And Jesus' statement in, in chapter 13, verse 9, sums this up well. He says, He who has ears, let him hear. So those with ears to hear will. And those who don't, won't. And so the same parable, the, literally the same story in effect, will on one hand hide truth from self-righteous and self-satisfied people who care not to hear from Jesus, and at the same time reveal truth to those who are eager 
to come and sit and listen to the words of Christ with childlike faith. Dual function. Those with ears to hear will, and those who don't will not. So with all that there, let's sort of dive in here. Let's begin to deal with this first parable. Let's read this. And I, I just want to give you... Listen, when we're, when we're going to read this story, I want you to just hear it as a story. Jesus is intending to tell a story. Don't, don't yet begin to start putting in things here. He's, he's going to give the story, and then we're going to look at the explanation. But, but what often happens is Christians come here, and they begin to try to do interpretation before they just get a wide swath of what is the story. It's a very basic story, very simple. So let's read this, chapter 13, starting in verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. And other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. So it's a very simple story. And even though this is not the context we are typically surrounded with, um, I've literally never seen a farmer ever sow seed. And probably many of you have never seen that either. But nevertheless, you can get the picture, right? In Jesus' day, this would have been a very basic image. They would have seen this from the time they were very young to the time, you know, they're very old. This is, this is life, agricultural type of life. So it's a very simple picture, right? You have a farmer. He's going out. He has seed, and he's sowing his seed in his land. And the seed is landing in multiple different places. And in some places it comes up, in some places it doesn't. And, and it's really just a very basic picture of a farmer putting out seed and, and, and allowing that seed to sprout based on the soil in which it lands. So we don't need to get into any huge depth on that right now. I just want you to see the picture. Very basic imagery. And now what, what we get, now you don't get it so much in Matthew. You, you know, we read that verse in, in, in verse 10. The disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? So it doesn't seem as though they're necessarily asking the meaning of this particular parable. But as Luke puts it, the disciples actually come to him and ask him, first, what is the meaning of this parable? And then they also ask him, why do you speak in parables? So we actually do get quite explicitly that the disciples are wondering, what does this parable mean? So, they're eager to understand. They want to know what the story means. They do indeed have ears to hear, and so Jesus explains it to them. So, if you look at verse 18, you'll see where the explanation begins to enter in. And he's going to unpack this. Now, from verse 9, where he ends the parable, the actual story, until verse 18, where the explanation enters in, We've already briefly looked at that. That's where G Jesus is explaining to his disciples the purpose of the parables. So I know there's a gap there, but nevertheless, you're going you're gonna to be able to see how these connect in. This is quite clearly the explanation to the parable. So before we examine this, I want to lay out a couple things to you so that you can see where we're going and you can, get some, you can get some eyes to be able to see this as we flesh it out. I am calling this a parable of hearts. And the reason I'm doing that is because I think as we examine this parable, you will see that, number one, it's not a parable of the sower. 
this is one of those unfortunate places where the, the heading there in chapter 13 is not so accurate. Um, it's not even really a parable of soils. Because remember, the parable is the story. The story is meant to signify something. So we got to keep that in mind. The elements in the parable are supposed to represent something and therefore reveal to us the spiritual truth. And, the, and in the parable, the soils, what I'm going to hope to show you, is that the soils speak of people's hearts. There are four different types of soils. And in the parable, there are, in Jesus' explanation, there are four different ways in which people's hearts are going to respond to the gospel being sown. And what I intend to ask you is basically this. Brethren, as we look at these verses, I want you to ask yourself, which one of these soils are you? Which one of these best represents your heart? Because as we'll see by the end, there is no more important question than this. This is why Jesus lays this parable out as, you see it in Mark. He says, if you don't understand this one, you can understand the rest of them. There's a, there's a huge importance built upon this particular parable. And so let's look at Jesus' explanation. <clears throat> let's read verse eight, verses 18 and 19. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Now Jesus is going to begin to deal with them in the same order that he brought them up in the original parable. And I want you to take note of a couple key interpretive principles as we look at the rest of these. Notice first that the seed in the, the story, the seed is meant to represent, he says here, the word of the kingdom. You see, it says that the word is what is sown in his heart. So the seed is the word in Mark's account. It, he just simply says the word. In Matthew, obviously, he says the word of the kingdom. In Luke's account, he says the word of God. Now, we're going to use Luke's phraseology moving forward because I think it's easiest for us to grasp when we just say the word of God. But then notice the next thing. And I already briefly stated it. But where does it say that this word is being sown? It says that it's sown in his heart. This is why I'm calling this a parable of hearts. These soils represent hearts. The Word of God is sown in the hearts of men, and those hearts respond to the Word in different ways. Jesus gives us four ways here. So the first image is that of a seed sown along the path. You can see that back in verse 4 of the, of the original parable. But Jesus is going to give, uh, he's going to use this particular example to explain the individual who falls into the category of verse 19. And in the parable, it was very simple, right? The seed is thrown onto the ground and immediately the birds come and pluck up the seed. And this imagery is, again, we're not in this culture, this context, so it's kind of hard for us to grasp, but the imagery is that of a footpath. You, you would be, this footpath would surround the field, and as the farmer would scatter his seed, this would be where he would walk to scatter the seed in his field. It would be a well-worn path, walked on for years and years, centuries even. And so the ground was hard, essentially impenetrable for any seed. So because of that, it'd fall on the ground, nothing would happen, the birds would have free reign to come and pluck up anything that was dropped there. And so here's what Jesus says this is like. There are those who hear the word of God and cannot understand it. The evil one comes and snatches away any remnant of what has been sown in the heart of this individual. 
And brethren, sadly, this is representative of a lot of what we see in our day. The Word of God goes out all over the place, and people refuse to listen. Their hearts are like a well-worn path. The seed of the gospel just simply cannot burrow into it. It's too hard. Their hearts have been continually hardened, and any good news that is brought to them is simply left out to dry. And the devil happily comes along and snatches it up. And there's a warning here, brethren. There's a warning here for all. These words, it was said of King Rehoboam. This is King David's son. It said of him that he did evil, for he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. In, in some translations, it says that he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. So it's a, it's a very dangerous thing to shut oneself off from truth. It is a very dangerous thing to not set your heart to seek the Lord, but to harden it and, and refuse to hear the word of God. Brethren, we need to beware of that devilish bird that is always flying over looking for seed scattered upon a heart that will not receive it. it listen, I, this verse has always haunted me. And this, brethren, I would desire that it would not be said of any of us as it was said of Ephraim, that cursed people. Hosea chapter 4, verse 17, God says, Ephraim is joined to idols, leave him alone. Leave him alone. It is a terrible thing to be in a place where your heart is so hardened to the word of God that God simply leaves you alone. And the devil has free reign to come and snatch up every bit of gospel hope that is laid out to you. Folks, it is not good if this is representative of your heart. Let's look at the next one. Verses 20 and 21. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So the next soil seems promising. In fact, both of the next two seem promising, but, but problems arise for both of them. So you remember what Jesus said about this particular one. This seed sown on rocky ground, it springs up immediately, but since it has no depth of soil, it's scorched by the sun. That's, you can see that back in verse 5 of the actual parable. And look, I know that can sound kind of confusing because we think, how in the world does a plant come up when it's on rocky ground and there's no soil? But that picture is not, it's not like my front yard where it's just, a, you know, rocks laying out there. It's, it's a reference to a, a farmland that has a certain amount of decent topsoil, maybe, maybe a foot or so, but hidden underneath that is a rock bed of some sort, limestone or something else. And so the, the farmer would actually plow his land and it would seem like everything was good, but he would not know that just a, a little bit down would be a rock bed that would actually keep his plants from growing. And uh, so here's what would happen with the plant, obviously. You have that, that decent amount of topsoil, so the seed would take and it would spring up quickly, very quickly. But it's, it would not be able, because of the rock bed, to put proper roots down. And so when the sun would come and, and the heat would come, it would actually scorch the plant and the plant would die. Because it, it, couldn't, it couldn't take. And in, in Luke's account, he says that it withered away because it had no moisture. And that's the idea. The soil simply cannot provide life to the plant because it has no life to give. There's barely anything there. 
And so Jesus is going to apply this image to the individual that's going to fall into this particular category. And there are many. There are many who they hear the word, they receive the word, they receive it with joy. It's as though their eyes are open to the truth and they greatly desire to run with it. But the problem is they endure, it says, only for a little while. Only for a while. And it's problematic because did not our Lord say, he who endures to the end will be saved? He did say that. And so this is very problematic. Herein lies the heart of a person that is incapable of endurance. There's no, there's no real root. They're really only in this while it goes well and it's enjoyable. Trees put down roots to sustain themselves, to find water. The roots are intended to go deep or go wide. And so that if there's no rain for a time, the, the, the tree will still be able to survive off of the water in the ground. And there are people who never put down roots in Christ. So that when the dry season comes, they can be sustained. So the dry season comes. Matthew tells us that the tribulation or the persecution arises on account of the word. And immediately they fall away. They can't stand. Mark tells us that it's a time of testing. So there's those who, when faced with tribulation or time of testing, they simply fall away. Their heart is like that rocky soil that you see back there in the parable. At first, it seems receptive. The, 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 the presentation of the gospel hope is laid out to them, and they receive it quickly, and they spring up. But in time, they are shown to be what they always were. Nothing but a hard rock bed massed in pretense. Looked good on the surface, but underneath was rock hard. And brethren, we need to take heed of this. We have got to be on guard. Examine yourself. Jesus says you must endure. Brethren, are you enduring? Or is your heart wavering? Did you spring up quickly? but have found yourself falling away? Did you fail to put down sufficient roots in Christ? And now the sun's come up, and you're beginning to be scorched. Folks, if this soil looks much like your heart, examine it closely. But there might be grace there still. Grace laid out to you that maybe God has not yet brought the trial that would scorch you, and that would destroy your plant. Maybe he has left time for you. You know, Jesus says that to the church in Revelation. He, he talks about this prophet Jezebel that came in and was leading away the people into sin. He said, I gave her time to repent. Isn't that grace? Now, she did not repent. But what grace of the Lord? Brethren, maybe God has given you that. He's left you time that you might put roots down and that this might not be you. I would exhort you hasten to change that before the sun comes up and you are scorched. We're told this in Revelation 14, 12. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Let's look at this next one, verse 22. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So once again, we have a plant that sprouts, but growing right along with this plant is the very thing that will kill it. And so you remember how Jesus put it in the parable. The seed sown among the thorns, and the thorns grow up, and they choke it out. The basic fact is this. In living in Las Vegas, you all probably know this. Thorny plants and weeds grow a lot faster than pretty much any other plant. And they will grow quickly, 
and they will take all of the nutrients and all of the water and it will kill anything that you have in that ground. And the plant will die. And a farmer who plants his crop in a, in a field infested with weed will soon find out that he has no crop. It will, it will kill it. It will choke it out. And so Jesus likens this to the particular individual who hears the word, but is eventually choked out by the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. And Mark, in his account, adds something else interesting. He says that the desire for other things comes in and chokes out the word. So you see what's happening. These people hear the word. In short, they they find it to be good. They find it to be a good thing. This, This plant comes up and begins to grow, but growing right along with it at a much faster rate are other things that will eventually tear them away from Christ. Our Lord said it plainly, no one can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. There are any number of things, brethren, any number of things that will tear you away from worship of Christ. You have... You have A few named here. You have cares of the world. You have deceitfulness of riches. You have a mark, desires for other things. This is the heart of the person whose heart is torn from worship of God and is infatuated with other things. They care more about their life's problems than they do about their soul. And listen to me. I know how it is. I have seen this. You present this truth to people and they go, no, 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 no. I, 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 Jesus Christ is everything to me. But you look at their life and it's so evident that he is not everything to them. They care more about their own life situation than they do about their soul. They care more about their money than they do about their Bible. They consume themselves with thinking about desires for better things and better life. And all the while, they are dying. They are being choked out. They're dying a slow death, and they don't even know it. And they believe that if they just had this, or they just had that, or they could accomplish this, or they they could get their life in order in this way or that way, that it, it it would solve everything, it would fix everything. Brethren, this is that which is choked out by the weeds. The deceitfulness of riches, brethren, the deceitfulness of riches. This has brought about absolute warfare on the hearts where the gospel seed has been sown. How many have been torn away by the deceitfulness of riches? That's exactly what Paul says about Demas. You know, you read about Paul, and he's talking about this man, Demas, who's laboring alongside of him. And then you find him all of a sudden saying, Demas has went off into the world. It's a very sad thing. These things are fatal. And brethren, that phrase, desire for other things, that is a haunting phrase. What a terrible thing, folks, to hear that on the final day from our Lord. You desired other things. Very fearful words. Brethren, remember well the words of the Lord Jesus. What does it profit a man? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And loses his soul. And maybe you've, I've said this often. But that Jesus is saying. What would it profit you. If you literally had 
everything and lost your soul, how much more of a fool would you be to not even gain everything and lose your soul? But to just gain the little bit of what you would gain in this life. What a foolish thing to do. So folks, I ask, are you here? Are you being choked out by the cares of this world? By desires for riches? By desires for other things? What will it profit you? When all that you had is spiritually choked out and dead. I've seen it myself. People, they seem to sprout up and they seem well. But it becomes quite clear that they had their eyes set on other things, worldly things. They had their eyes set on other idols other than Christ. And folks, may it not be for any in here. Verse 23. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Now finally, brethren, we have a glimmer of hope, right? We might think that all hearts are just simply bound to reject the gospel that is sown into the hearts of men, but that is not God's intention. Here we find not only a good soil, but the proof of a good soil. This final one is the one where Jesus says in the parable, the seed that falls on good soil and produces grain to differing degrees. And the simple fact is this, brethren, good soil will produce good crop. And this is the effect. This is the effect of the word of God sown into the heart that is receptive by faith. These are those who are born again by the Spirit of God. Jesus says they hear the word and they understand it. In Mark, he says, not only do they do that, but they accept it. You see, it's, it is in fact possible to hear the word and to understand it and yet not accept it. But not here though. The hearing is with ears to hear and the seeing is with eyes to perceive the glories and the treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's exactly what Paul says to the Thessalonians. You received the word of God, which you heard from us. You accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. So you see that it's those who hear it, they understand it, they accept it. And brethren, they could do nothing but, they can do nothing but, they hear it and they accept it, they cherish it. Remember, we read the words of, of Paul to the church at Corinth. The word of the cross is folly, is stupid to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It has two different effects. This is this not what we saw in Jesus' explanation? The word is foolishness to them, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Brethren, this is the heart that has these glorious words of life sown into it. And it receives those words. It accepts those words. It loves and believes those words. It holds fast to those words. And that's exactly how Luke says it. He says that upon hearing the word, they hold fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. And that's an important point to note. They're bearing fruit. So not only do you have the good soil, but you have the proof of that that soil is in fact good. They're bearing fruit. Now, the fruit which comes from this soil will obviously vary. Jesus says some 100, some 60, some 30. The fruitfulness produced in the life of a Christian is going to vary, but it will be there. 
Jesus said, you will know a tree by its fruit. He did not say you will know a tree by how much fruit it bears at any given season. He says, you'll know a tree by its fruit. It will be there. You will see it there. There are seasons of plenty and there are seasons of drought in the Christian life. Anybody who has been a Christian will know this. Some seasons will bear a hundredfold and some will not. And this is why I think Luke puts it the way he does, that they will bear fruit with patience. The, the patient, continual walk with the Lord will bear fruit. It will. And folks, be mindful. Remember, those whose hearts prove unfruitful are not in this soil. They're not. The fruit that doesn't mature is not representative of this soil that is approved by our Lord. No fruit, this is not you. It can't be you. The fruit comes. It's an indication that you are the soil. This is the marker. As our Lord says, he who has ears, let him hear. Now I want to close with a couple of final thoughts. Once again, I want to circle back to that question. I want you to ask yourself, which soil are you? How has your heart reacted to the good news of Jesus? Have you outright rejected it? Have you accepted it with joy? Only to find out that in a time of testing and difficulty, you abandoned that same gospel that you said you came to love? Have you accepted it, all the while hiding the idols of your own heart and the cares of this world and your desire for riches and your desire for other things have choked out that gospel seed that was at once planted in your heart? Brethren, have you heard that word and have you accepted it and held it fast with an honest and good heart and borne fruit in patience? Listen, I hope that you recognize that the need is quite simple. Even for the genuine Christian. I mean, listen, I, as, I, as I came to this this week, I found myself, you know, I, it's like I have three pieces here which don't speak of good things, which speak of the gospel going out and people not listening. Or, or they do listen, and they're false. And I got to come to that, and I got to preach that. It's just there. But then it's like there's this other piece. There's such this great hope that God is going gonna, is gonna to bring fruit from this good soil as the gospel seed is planted in their hearts. And it's, I got to deal with both of them. And what I don't want is this. The, there are two different sides to this that could be problematic. One is the genuine Christian that really is in this last soil, and yet is going to look at themselves very introspectively and be very fearful. And what I don't want is the genuine Christian to do that and feel dejected and feel as though there's no hope for them. But what I also don't want is the person who really does not know the Lord, who is in one of these other categories, to think, oh yeah, I'm just in the good soil, no big deal. And I need a guard against both of those. But the hope is the same for both, is it not? What are you to do? No matter where you find yourself in here. Even especially if you're a Christian who's looking at this and, you, and, and, and you're, you're bogged down by, by wondering. What are you to do, brethren? You're to look to Christ. Look to Him. Hope in Him. Do you do that? Are you hoping in Him? Listen, when Jesus says, He who endures to the end will be saved, that is not intended to depress the Christian. That is intended to encourage them to do that. Day by day, look to Christ in faith. Worry not about tomorrow, whether you will endure tomorrow. Worry about today. Put all your trust and all your faith in Christ today. You endure today, and when tomorrow comes, you endure tomorrow. You don't need to ask the question of tomorrow. You're in today. You may not even make it to tomorrow. 
So put all of it in Christ. And listen, Jesus says his yoke is light. His burden is easy. Brethren, I can assure you that that's the case. If you look to assurance, look to nothing other than the fact that Jesus Christ accomplished that on behalf of his people. And he says to them, whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. He will not do it. Brethren, if there's a promise in Scripture that you can bank on, it is that. Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. And I know I've talked to many over the years. Well, what about that unforgivable sin? And what about, and what about, Jesus says, whoever comes, I will not cast you out. So you can know for certain if you come, Jesus won't cast you out. It's really that simple, brethren. It's really that simple. And the scripture would have you to look to Christ in faith day by day to hope in him. To endure today. Well, today is called today. Worry about tomorrow when you get to tomorrow. And brethren, examine your heart here. Because there is no more important question. There is not. You don't want to find out later. Listen, I've talked with people. And it's like they, they cannot deal with the fact that they, they just don't know the Lord. Because they think they've been a fraud forever. But listen, brother, what good is it? On the end, at the, at, the, at the end of the days, you get there before the Lord. Is it going to be any good that you lied your whole life? Is there going to be any good? Is there going to be any value in that? What a better thing to just deal with it. To just deal with it before the Lord. And to deal with it speedily. Brother, my hope is that all of you on that final day, would be represented by that good soil which bore fruit in patience. May God do it for His glory. Let's pray.